Are you looking to build a new gaming PC for in and around $1,200? If so, I've got just the video for you. Featuring an RTX 3060 Ti, Intel Core i5 processor, and loads of other great hardware that gives top-notch performance at a more affordable price point, this build is a little bit special and an absolute champion when it comes to price-to-performance metrics. I'll be running you guys through all of the parts that make it possible, how to put it together step-by-step, step, and looking at performance later on. Let's do this. Gigabyte Aura 17 range of gaming notebooks are fantastic for playing the latest AAA titles at the best settings. With a 1080p 360Hz display, these are awesome for competitive gaming, featuring 12th gen Intel Core processors, which boasts phenomenal single and multi-threaded performance for gaming and productivity applications. Learn more and check out the full range at the first links in the description below. Now then, I'm going to stop waving my screwdriver like some sort of wand and cover off the parts that make this thing possible. Everything from the CPU to the motherboard, the RAM, and all of the components in between. Now, the two most important parts of any gaming PC are the processor, or your CPU as it's often known, and the graphics, otherwise known and referred to as the GPU. And for this build, I've got one of the best mid-range CPU and GPU combos you can buy right now. Processing power will be provided by the Intel Core i5 12400F, a slightly tuned down version of Intel's 12600K with no integrated graphics and no overclocking support. Now that's absolutely fine as it saves us money and out of the box this thing still provides top tier performance. The lack of any graphics involved also saves us a further 10 or 20 dollars which of course will be provided by the GPU. The RTX 3060 Ti is a pretty unique card from Nvidia. Not only does it provide great performance, actually kind of making the 3070 a bit obsolete for the price point, but it has has no direct AMD rival. The 6650 XT is cheaper but provides much less by way of performance, while the 6800 non-XT is kind of worse but also quite a bit more expensive. With 8GB of GDDR6 VRAM, plenty of CUDA cores, RT cores and Tensor cores for the latest ray tracing and DLSS driven applications, this thing looks good in any environment. 1440p is sort of its forte if you will when it comes to performance, but 1080 will give you even higher frame rates. I can't talk highly enough of the 3060 Ti, but James, isn't there a rumoured 4060 Ti about to land? Yes there is, however, if it's anything like any other Nvidia release we've seen over the last two and a half months, it's probably going to cost double what the 3060 Ti costs and not really provide all that much more value in terms of frame rate per dollar than a card like this. This is great, don't sleep on it, pick it up and you will not be disappointed. In terms of other components that make this build tick over, you get it? CPU punt. Anyway, I'll move on. Motherboard is the MSI MAG B660M Mortar Wi-Fi DDR4. Now, this board does also support 13th gen processors, so you could tune up to a 13600K or the rumoured 13400F once that arrives in Q1 next year, with BIOS flashback capabilities to tune this up ready to support those next gen processors. For storage, a simple 500 gig or one terabyte Samsung SSD 980 will work. It's not the Pro, it's not the Evo, just a standard 980. Read and write speeds of about three gigabytes a second make it a great choice for the money, super reliable, and you're backed by that awesome Samsung reputation and support package. For the memory, a 16 gigabyte kit of Corsair's Vengeance RGB RS will give us just about enough RAM for a build like this. You can go for 32 gigs if you've got deeper pockets and want a bit more for all those Chrome tabs that you're going to open. Reading geekawatt.com, which you can check out the first links below. Finally, the last couple of things to note are the case, which is the Corner Master CMP320, Micro ATX, great value, awesome airflow. That's about it, really. And the power supply, which is the Corsair CX650F. It's RGB because of course it is. 2022, 2023, depending when this comes out. Why wouldn't it have RGB? It's also got really nice integrated cables and is available in either a black or a white colorway. So that's the components. If you'd like to learn more about them, check out latest pricing and such. They will be linked at the affiliate links below. For now though, it's time to get this thing built. And let me start by walking you through the CPU, motherboard, RAM and SSD. The only thing really with installing an Intel CPU to be aware of is that the socket can be quite delicate. 
because the pins are actually integrated into the socket itself, if you drop the CPU or you mishandle it, you can cause them to bend. And that is, well, basically game over. So line up the triangles as shown on your screen, then slide the CPU in. You'll see that it's seated correctly with the little small notches on the bottom. And if you give it a slight wiggle from either side, you'll get a bit of movement, but not all that much. Then return the socket cover down and use this little notch to push it into place. You might find that giving it a bit of a wiggle actually helps the thing to seed a bit better. And eventually this black plastic socket protector will fall off. Keep a hold of that in case you ever sell your motherboard or need to send it off for an RMA issue. And then the CPU's in. That was actually very easy. I've, I've bigged it up, but as long as you're careful and you get the technique right, you're all good. The key thing is not closing the cover when you're not happy the CPU is seeded properly. Because all the cover's gonna do is clamp the processor into place. And if it's not in properly, that's when it will start bending pins. Rather controversially, or at least I think it's a controversial decision, I'm actually gonna stick with the Intel stock cooler for this build. Now, admittedly, you could pick up a pretty good aftermarket air cooler for another $40. But in a build like this, another $40 here and another $40 there and suddenly you're $300 over budget and no one wants that. Now this processor is not actually all that hot, so a cooler like this will be fine, we're not overclocking, so it's all good really. A bit of thermal paste is needed on the processor, though some of these do come with it pre-applied, and then this clicks in corner by corner using the little pop points on either end. That makes this a completely toolless installation. Memory is next up, this is pretty easy to install, we're going to be using the second and fourth dim slots, that will give us dual channel performance. If you've got four, obviously use all four, if you've just got one, use the second. Then install the memory, lining up the notch on the RAM with that of the dim slot. It is very marginally off center. So you want to make sure that you've got that all A-OK. -okay. In our case, the Corsair logo facing away from the CPU. Then to finish both dims off, a bit of pressure, They'll click into place and that's all we need to do. The only other thing to pop into the motherboard now before moving over to the case is the SSD. Samsung's SSD 980 is going to slot into this slot just here with the teeny tiny screw that's pre-installed in the standoff holding it down into place. Once all of that's done, the motherboard assembly is complete and it's case time. Da -da 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 -da. Boom. Case time. To go about doing this next stage, you want to take your case, in our instance, Cooler Master's flashy CMP320, the bigger CMP520 also impressed us when we had it in, and just strip off all the side panels, as taking these off is going to make the whole build that much easier to access. The board nice and easily then will slide in from the top of the case once those panels have been removed, and will just sit on all of the available standoffs. You can see these standoffs highlighted in a bit more detail with the white circles at the top, middle, and along the bottom of the motherboard case area. And once this is in, the case can go back upright and make- Whoa! Turns out the hard drive cage wasn't screwed in. Might want to look at that one, Cooler Master. Or maybe that was me from the last build I did. Anyway, the GPU is next up. My beautiful table has been scratched by the hard drive cage. No, no, no. We'll forever sit on this shelf. Next up, GPU, which we can actually go ahead and install this time around. And here it is, the RTX. That's a bit better, 3060 Ti. Now, talked in detail about this earlier. Awesome GPU, this MSI Gaming X Trio card. is a bit of a looker, really. There are more, wow, what's the word? Affordable 3060 Ti's out there. There's some cheaper options with smaller coolers. But to be honest with you, graphics cards are about as cheap as they've been at any point in the last couple of years. And latest pricing and availability for different regions and retailers can be found below. The only thing you want to watch out for is that this graphics card is quite long, which helps with cooling, but installing it into a case like this makes your whole life a bit more nerve-wracking. Now, the good news is it does actually fit with, in today's standards, quite a lot of room to spare. I mean, if you look at the size of the next-gen 4080s, and some of those cards barely fit in even the biggest cases. Remove any of the installation brackets that you need to take out, and then it's a simple case of lining up the GPU over the slot and sliding it in. So push that back, line it in. You've got to kind of put it in at a bit of an angle, but that's fine. And we've noticed a problem. Now, you may be able to see at the back here that some of the PCI lane covers are removed and some aren't. Now, these are the really, really horrible, cheap, single-use ones where, to get rid of them, you have to snap them out. And that means if you take off the wrong one, or like we have, where we've built a PC before that used the middle two, you now can't patch that up because that's not re-screwable. It just bends and breaks, and it shouldn't really need to be done, even on the most budget cases. But here we are. Nevertheless, I was hoping I wasn't going to have to remove that, but things don't always go quite to plan. We can still whack the GPU in, though, slide it in the slot, 
apply a bit of pressure and it will click into place nice and easily. Spin the case around, fasten the GPU down with a couple of screws. So we've got one down towards the bottom here and another one at the top. Now, top tip, it can be a good idea to actually hold up the graphics card while you do this as doing this will help to prevent sag and put it in the optimal position. So if you hold it up, tighten it as much as you can. There we go. That'll stop it drooping quite so far downwards. Otherwise though, the only thing really left to do is add back on the cover I took off a moment ago, which was held in by a couple of thumb screws. There we have it. And then it's a simple case of wiring the whole build up with Corsair's CX650F RGB power supply. Now, with this video being a slightly more affordable build and a great option for the first time builders out there, let's do a full cables and wiring guide and cover off exactly how to plug everything in. Now the power supply itself needs a few cables, a CPU, motherboard, GPU, and SATA power. So four key cable designs. These are what we're going to plug into the semi-modular interface or fully modular interface in this case on the power supply before screwing the unit in to the back of the case. Then you'll be running the CPU power cable up to the top left, the motherboard which is the largest cable to the right and your GPU which is actually two cables in one up to our graphics card. So two 8-pin connectors in our case. Not actually all that difficult. You've just got to take it step by step. Take your time and you'll be just fine on the cables and wiring front. And then we're finally ready to boot this thing up and take a look at performance. system looks awesome it's time to make sure that the performance results tally up equally as well and let's kick things off in style with a bit of warzone 2 shall we at 1440p high with dlss enabled and set to quality this machine pulled in an impressive 101 frames per second that's a very impressive showing here and if you wanted more frame rate you could drop to 1080p and easily exceed the 140 fps mark Move through into Apex Legends and the good results carry on rolling in. 1440p high, this time the system achieved 154 FPS on average. 90 and 99th percentile results were consistent too, and all of the frame rate data as usual was gathered with both Nvidia, Frameview and NSI Afterburners Revertuner. Overwatch 2 also performed very well, 1440p ultra settings in this title, and the frame rate of the day was 180 frames per second on average. Overwatch 2 is not really Really any more difficult than Overwatch 1 to actually run and visually the game looked fantastic. Finally we also gave Fortnite a go on this system and this time around at 1080p competitive settings the build easily excelled more than 200 frames per second on average. This system then pulled in some mightily impressive results in everything from the latest AAA titles to huge first person shooters and the range of available esports oriented titles out there. All the links to all the parts mentioned will be in the description below. Thanks for tuning in and as always, I'll see you in the next one.